and um, like uh, i'm sure you must be knowing about uh, ich and uh, through our uh, professor kundu sir and uh, jadeep yes yes yeah yeah uh, and we have a pediatric nephrology unit and uh, we have been uh, uh, doing this uh, as i told you like we started around the the covid time uh, we are not doing it less frequently but still trying to do it maybe once every month or alternate alternate net month and we have a running fellowship program okay so we have a couple of fellows with us uh, and uh, in this uh, uh, has joined online also and uh, we are hoping that uh, you will be able to uh, teach us on the uh, unit tract infection uh, particularly the difficult one the multi tract resistant because uh, over this last uh, few years uh, we have been been seeing even uh, uh, children coming from community with uh, with uh, mdr with uh, esbl so uh, and uh, and in ICH, in uh, PICU setup, or in our own setup with like indwelling catheters, it is no longer uncommon to to have UTIs with everything R. Uh, there have been occasions where the, like I've said, okay, then that's a good news. Uh, you can't do anything. You you can't give any antibiotics because everything is R. And the newer and newer a antibiotics are coming up. Most of them are with very difficult names. And I can't even understand, like remember them also. And uh, and then there is this uh, new upcoming of uh, faropenum, which uh, seems to be the uh, solution for everything. But I'm sure it is not. So uh, all of this, uh, uh, I hope you will be able to to cover in your uh, lecture. Like uh, also, like we had a recent discussion in our unit, like exactly what is the role of faropenum when to to switch from uh, oral to IV, all those things. So um, I think we, we can start uh, because uh, we were still waiting for Dr. Suman Poddar to join, but most probably, as I said, mm -hmm. that he might I, be having. Yeah, to... because you know, I still have some rounds left. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We will start them. We will start yeah. them. So, yeah. uh, so I'd like to officially start uh, and uh, welcome to, to everyone. To this uh, session, uh, Doctor uh, Single doesn't need any introduction. She is well known across India and uh, abroad as uh, one of the the person to go if you are having any infectious disease uh, uh, problem, ID problem. She is a consultant pediatrician and uh, infectious disease specialist in uh, Wakilaben Hospital at. Uh, in Mumbai and uh, what uh, we have requested her to do today is uh, is a dwell on the the intricacies of something which is becoming quite common the uh, multi drug resistant UTIs um, and we are getting to see this at least in the nephrology world even in in children who are not that sick so uh, uh, Dr. Singhal you can start sharing your slide and uh, after that, we will definitely have questions. So if you have got any questions, uh, anyone uh, feel free to just uh, put it in the chat box. Thanks. Yes. So thanks, Dr. Sina, for that introduction. And um, <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking about drug-resistant um, pediatric UTI. And um, hope I, I'm, you know, my presentation will answer some of your um, questions which you may have. Okay. So um, we all know that UTI is a common infection in infants and children. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to discuss the basics about resistance in gram-negative pathogens because if we are supposed to treat our infections properly, we need to have some knowledge at least about the microbiology and how do we interpret the susceptibility reports. Then I'll discuss empiric therapy, definitive therapy, and finally, I end by showing a couple of really cases of really difficult UTI, which were very challenging. 
Now, um, when we talk about resistance in gram-negative pathogens, most of the resistance is because of beta-lactamase production. We know that this is an enzyme which hydrolyzes the beta-lactams, that is the penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, etc. And there are various classes of beta-lactamases. So the first generation beta-lactamase is the one which is present in staph and the respiratory pathogens and in some E. coli which hydrolyzes amoxicillin, but your cephalosporins and amoxclab work against these infections. So, in fact, that is why for a long time, uh, our E. coli was only producing first-generation beta-lactamase and therefore we were using drugs like cephalexin, cefixime, amoxclab for treatment. But then in the 1980s came the extended spectrum beta-lactamases, again produced by mainly E. coli and Klebsiella. And these were um, hydrolyzing your cephalosporins also. And this is what is our biggest problem in the management of UTI today. And if you have to treat these ESBL pathogens, then you have to either use BLBLI combinations like Piptazo, Cephoperzone Sulbactam, or Carbapenems. Now, there are sometimes beta lactamases called AMC beta lactamases, which are produced specially by Pseudomonas and Proteus which are also important urinary tract pathogens. And here, the amount of beta-lactamase that is produced is so much that you can't manage by giving BL-BLI combination. So either you have to use carbapenems or you have to use uh, like um, the new beta-lactamase inhibitor called avibactam-based therapy. And then what we are seeing in our hospital-acquired infections is carbapenemase producing um, organisms, which which destroy the carbapenems also. And here we have different types of carbapenemases produced in our country, but the most common are NBM and OXA48. And, you know, if you uh, basically, it is not only important to know whether your organism is resistant to carbapenems, but it is also important to know what kind of carbapenemase that organism is producing. Because if you are producing only OXA48, then you can use CAS AV or Ceftazidime Avibactam. But if you are producing NBM, then you can't use Ceftazidime Avibactam. So we will discuss some of these issues later on. But the main problem is ESBL in community-acquired UTI and in hospital-acquired UTI, you, can, you are seeing carbapenem resistant pathogens. Also, to top it all, you know, when your organism doesn't produce just one type of beta-lactamase, so it will produce multiple types. And then simultaneously, there will be other mechanisms of resistance to other drugs, like there will be porin problem, efflux, everything will be there in one organism so that you have drug resistance to a single drug by multiple mechanisms and you have multiple drugs which become resistant. In fact, quinolone resistance is so common nowadays that none of our isolates are actually sensitive to the quinolones. Now, before we go on to management, we must understand a few basics about antibiotic susceptibility testing because it's on the basis of your <coughs> susceptibility report that you are going to treat your patient. So we have different methods. So you have disk diffusion, you have dilution methods and gradient diffusion. So disk diffusion is, for example, what we used to learn that you have a Petri dish with the culture plate and with the culture media, you put the, you inoculate it with the inoculum um, and then you also put a disc which is coated with the antibiotic. So as the um, antibiotic diffuses out in the culture plate, its concentration goes on reducing. So you have a zone of inhibition which is seen. And if the zone of inhibition is large, it means probably the bacteria is sensitive. If it is small, then it means it is resistant. Obviously, you can't express it as 1 plus, 2 plus. You have to compare it to various breakpoints. Now, many labs have actually moved over to dilution methods like um, automated methods like Vitec, BD Phoenix, etc., um, Phoenix, etc., where you have the uh, machine itself which gives you a susceptibility based on determination of MIC, which is the minimum inhibitory concentration needed to uh, inhibit the growth of the organism. And sometimes you have broth microdilution methods like we use for cholestine susceptibility testing. And then you have gradient diffusion, like you see this, which is called as an E-strip. So the E-strip has different concentration of the antibiotic. And then when you place it in the Petri dish, 
the growth of the organism is in the form of an ellipse. Where it intersects the um, strip is the actual MIC. So, you know, for certain, um, you know, drugs like phosphomycin, etc., you might have to use E-strip methods. And then apart from these phenotypic methods, you have molecular methods also by which you can detect resistance genes. Like, you know, many panels are available which can tell you whether the organism is producing NVM, OXA, whether it is producing CTXM, which is a type of ESBL. And based on that, you can do it directly from the blood culture bottle. And that may actually give you your susceptibility resistance report much before your phenotypic methods. Now, when um, you get an antibiotic susceptibility report, the basis is to pronounce this principle is to pronounce organisms as sensitive, resistant or intermediate. And this is done by comparing the zone or the MIC to various kinds of breakpoints. So these breakpoints are fixed. You have a sensitive breakpoint and you have a resistance breakpoint. So if your MIC is below the sensitive breakpoint, it will be sensitive. If it is above the resistance breakpoint, it will be resistant. And it is in between the two breakpoints, it will be intermediate. And you have different breakpoints for different organisms and even different societies. Now, what is very important to remember is that these breakpoints are very, very conservative. So that means they... Um, just one sec. I'm still. The interruption. So um, what I'm trying to say is that the, uh, you know, chances of therapeutic success are um, uh, high if it is sensitive. But if it is resistant also, it's not, it does not mean that the chances of success are zero. It is called as six, it is 60%. So it's called as a 60 90 rule. And that is the reason why sometimes you see that, you know, you have a, you have started a particular antibiotic and the patient has get, got better. But once you get the sensitivity report, it shows that it is resistant. And you wonder why is that so? But it is because of this 60-90 rule. And another reason for this is because sometimes your antibiotic concentrates at the site of infection. So the levels which are there at that particular site are much higher as compared to the um, levels which are achievable in blood. So I just want to show you an example. For example, this is ampicillin. So ampicillin, you know, achieves different levels in different places. So for example, if it is there in the meninges, its level is very low. Um, more, uh, especially if there's no inflammation, if it is in the bloodstream, your level is 2.5. But if it is in the urine, the level is 600. So that means it is concentrated so much in the urine that even if your isolate is resistant to ampicillin, because that resistance breakpoint has been through the um, blood levels, it may sometimes work. So this is the reason why um, the 60-90 rule and the concentration of antibiotic at various body sites is the reason where you find a discrepancy between in vitro susceptibility and in vivo response. And what should we do if we have such a situation? Should we change the antibiotic or should we keep it at the original antibiotic? This is something which we are going to discuss a little bit later. Now, if you are treating really sick patients, then it is not just enough to look at the um, MICs, uh, to look at the sensitivity or resistance report. It is also important to look at the MIC. And you should not compare the absolute MIC values, but you should look, find out the breakpoints and that you can get from your lab. And or you can have a, a calculator or an app. I'll just show you in a minute. And then you see what is the MIC with respect to the breakpoint. And if the ratio is lower, the, the better it is. So for example, for meropenem, your breakpoint is 1. And if your MIC is 0.25, then your MIC to breakpoint ratio is 0.25, which is low. Now, suppose the MIC was 1 and the breakpoint is also at 1, then basically you may or may not succeed. Because what will happen is that the lab will give the report as sensitive, but you have to look at the MIC. This often, often happens with piprisillin tazobactam. Because piprisillin tazobactam, the breakpoint, sensitivity breakpoint is 8. 
So sometimes it will lab will say it is sensitive, but when you go and look at the actual MIC, you find that the MIC is eight. So that means it is just at the break point. And if your patient is seriously ill, maybe you would like to use an antibiotic whose MIC is well below the break point. And so that is why uh, you must also go a step ahead and not just look at the sensitive or resistant pattern, but you should look at the exact MIC. And this is particularly important if you're using drugs like piperacillin, tazobactam, you're using carbapenems, or you're using drugs like phosphomycin. Because for carbapenems also, you know that, you know, if your MIC to carbapenem is two or four, though it is intermediate, or resistant, you can go get, you can, uh, you know, succeed by using um, higher doses of carbapenems and giving it as a prolonged infusion. But if your MICs are more than 16, then no matter how much carbapenem you give, it will not be able to succeed. So please remember to not just to look at the sensitive resistant, but also look at the MIC. And this is just something if you have an Android phone, you can um, download this app, which is called as Breakpoint MIC. Uh, this is from UCAST where you have to, it's in Italian, but you can understand this. So you just have to enter the name of the bacterium and the uh, antibiotic and it will give you the breakpoint. What is the sensitive breakpoint and what is the resistance breakpoint? And that you can use as a ready reference for uh, comparing the MIC to the breakpoint. Now let us look at a report and this will this report will tell you why it is important to look at the MIC. Now this is an E. coli. And this is your sensitivity report. Now, what are the things that you are seeing in this report? One thing which you are seeing is that ceftriaxone is resistant. <laughs> so this is actually a ESBL pathogen. Now, the next step which you look at this is when you see this, you are trying to search for an oral antibiotic which you can use for this patient. So you look at TMP, SMX is resistant, Cipro is resistant, but you look at amoxiclav and it is showing sensitive. Does this mean that this patient may respond to amoxiclav? The answer is no, because though it shows as sensitive, but may, many times uh, it may not work well for an ESBL pathogen. Then another thing which you will get tempted is if you look at cefepine, you find that the interpretation is sensitive. But we know that for cefepine, anything more than one, the it is susceptibility dose dependent and it may not work. The third thing which you look at is, suppose you want to use piperacillin tazobactam in this patient. Then you look at the piperacillin tazobactam MIC. It is less than or equal to 4. So the breakpoint is 8. So it is quite sensitive. So you can use it. On the other hand, if you found that the piperacillin um, tazobactam MIC was 8, then it was just at the breakpoint and you may not want to use it. So this is a printout which comes from the Vitec machine and it gives you a lot of information and you must have, get into the habit of looking at it. Now, with that basics about, you know, antimicrobial susceptibility testing and interpretation of reports, let us move on to discuss about UTI. So, when we choose empiric antimicrobials in a child for UTI, we do it um, uh, because especially we want to do it if the patient is fever, is looking sick, once you have the urine routine, etc. before the cultures are available because you can't wait for 48 to 72 hours till the culture reports come. So how do you choose an antibiotic? It is based on many factors like what are the pathogens and you know you're expecting E. coli. What is the likely antimicrobial susceptibility? Now suppose you have a child who has been having recurrent UTI and has been has received antibiotics in the past three months there is a higher chance that such a patient may have a resistant pathogen. So you might want to use a good empiric antimicrobial. It also depends on the previous antibiotic exposure. You must always review the previous urine culture reports because many times these patients come with recurrent UTI. And if you find that the previous urine culture report showed it was ESBL pathogen, then you know that this time also it is going to be ESBL only. And you uh, there's no point starting with ceftriaxone or something. Also look at the severity of disease because if your patient is not sick, then you can always start with a lower antibiotic and after 48 hours, once your culture report comes, you can escalate. But if your patient is very sick and you are, then you can't, you have to use the best antibiotic right in the beginning. And you also have to decide based on the host comorbidities. Now, many people like to use amikacin for pediatric UTI because it is concentrated in the urine and a lot most of the pathogens are susceptible. But we must remember that 
you know, amikacin is a nephrotoxic antibiotic. So if you're already dealing with a child who has damaged kidneys, maybe you would want to choose another drug and not a aminoglycoside. Though short term, it may be good. Like it is cheap. It can be given once a day. But think of the long term damage which may you may cause by using amikacin in that patient. And also another important point which you have to remember is whether that antibiotic penetrates in the urinary tract. Um, and uh, for example, you may find an isolate which is sensitive to tigicycline, but you can't use tigicycline because it doesn't go into the urinary tract. You may have an isolate which is sensitive to chloramphenicol, but that will not go into the urinary tract. So you can't use those antibiotics. Now, this was just a study which was done almost 10 years ago in um, uh, Dr. Bala Subramanian's um, hospital in Chennai, where they looked at 100 children with community-acquired UTI. And what was surprising was that their ESBL rates were 40%. The, and there were no risk factors for ESBL. So they could not really find out by looking at various things what whether a patient predict whether a child could have ESBL or not. And when I spoke to Dr. Bala Subramanian last, he said their rates are about 80%. And I think we are all seeing a lot of ESBL urinary tract infections. And this is another study which was done from Velour, again, which shows you the sensitivity pattern. So if you look at the E. coli, its cephalosporin sensitivity is just 30%. That means 70% of them are ESBL. And um, aminoglycoside susceptibility, piptazo, carbapenem susceptibilities, etc. are quite good. So this tells you that even in community acquired infections, you have a lot of ESBL. So what are the common antibiotics which you use? Uh, Empiric for community acquired UTI. If you have an outpatient case, then we use cefexine because it is well tolerated. It has convenient dosing. You use amoxiclab. But the advantage of amoxiclav is that it has very high urinary levels and therefore it may work even for some ESBL pathogens because your um, uh, drug uh, gets into the urine. I told you that the levels of ampicillin and amoxicillin in the urine are very high. And then you have cotrimoxazole. The advantage of cotrimoxazole is that many ESBL strains are susceptible but the problem with cotrimoxazole is that if your child is already on cotrimoxazole prophylaxis for recurrent UTI, then you can't use it. For inpatients, you use ceftriaxone, which is a drug of choice. But the problem with this is that it doesn't work for ESBL pathogens. Amikacin is a good drug, but again, I told you it has ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. So in many cases, especially for ESBL UTI, when we are suspecting, we may have to use piptazo or cefoperazone sulbactam. Both of them work well for ESBL. The advantage of cefoperazone sulbactam is that it can be given twice a day. So that is good. So suppose you start treatment in hospital for two to three days, you give it and then the patient can take it at home. Whereas piperacillin tazobactam, it has to be given at least three times a day. And that is a problem in giving it at home. And of course, carbapenems are the option when your patient is really sick. And uh, in carbapenems, you use prefer meropenem. You don't really use a lot of imipenem because if your patient has renal dysfunction, your patient can get seizures. And you have ortapenem, which is again a good drug to switch over. But remember that in children below 12 years, you have to use ortapenem twice a day, not once a day like you do it in adults. So that is a limitation. <clears throat> now that is about empiric therapy. These are your choices. Your definitive therapy depends on your results of your urine culture and susceptibility and your clinical response. So um, antibiotic therapy, you may have to escalate, de-escalate, or you may have to switch to oral. And your decision should be based on both the clinical response and culture reports, not just the culture reports. Because as I said, that if you have a resistant pathogen on the culture, but the patient has clinically got better, you may not need to change. And I'll discuss that. And once you uh, give... I mean, all of us know that the duration of therapy is 10 to 14 days in pediatric UTI. Now, let us come to this case that you have a, a patient who is empirically started on third generation cephalosporin in hospital. The urine culture uh, grows ESBL E. coli. So you can see that it is ceftriaxone, cefuroxime resistant, quinolone resistant. And uh, the important thing is that it is also resistant to cotrimoxazole. This is a very common situation. The patient is clinically better. So why did this happen? I told you it can happen because your antibiotics are concentrated in the urine or because of the 60-90 rule. Now, what are the options that you have? Are you going to continue the same or you will change? 
So if the patient is clinically well, the fever has gone, the white cell count has come down, CRP has come down, then you don't need to change. You can discharge the patient on an oral third generation cephalosporin, but you have to watch these patients for late clinical failure or relapse. Many of these patients may come back to you with relapses. And then when they come back with the relapse, then you know that your ceftriaxone or cefexime is not going to work and you will have to go for a higher level antibiotic. Now, I think that was the, uh, so how will you continue therapy for ESBL pathogens on discharge? You can not use nitrofurantoin, even if it is susceptible because nitrofurantoin is only a luminal uh, antibiotic. It will not work for the tissue. You can easily give cotrimoxazole uh, if it is sensitive. If it is not sensitive, then you have to choose. You can use once daily aminoglycoside, but I told you it is nephrotoxic. You can use BLBLI combinations or ertapenem. Now, some people use cefexime clavulinic acid, especially in adults, but there's not much data. And the drug which all of us are really looking out for is faropenem because you have this situation of an ESBL UTI and you want to use faropenem. So can we use faropenem? Now, a little bit about faropenem that this is actually a beta-lactam antibiotic belonging to the penem class. And it is not exactly same as the carbapenems because, you know, when you talk about faropenem, you think meropenem ke baad you can give faropenem, but they are different antibiotics because the side chain is different. So if you look at a carbapenem, this is the ring, which is common with faropenem, but then this is the side chain for carbapenems, whereas here you have a different ring, which is the tetrahydrofuran ring. So it was first approved in Japan in 1997, but it is not approved by FDA. It is not approved by the EMA and it is approved in India for the past 10 years. But earlier it was just a tablet, but now the syrup form is also available. Now, this ferropenem uh, works against um, a lot of pathogens and uh, they are in vitro studies which show that it is works against the ESBL producing E. coli and Klebsiella. But the main problem with faropenem is that there is no way to check for susceptibility because there is no disc available. And even if a disc was available, there are no breakpoints which are available. So you cannot, like for many other antibiotics, you will have a sensitivity report saying whether it is sensitive or not. For faropenem, you cannot have that. It is well absorbed and it is not very expensive. Now, what are, what is the problem with faropenem? So one is that they are sometimes case there is they are cases where you used faropenem and you converted an ESBL pathogen into a carbapenem resistant pathogen. Now that is something which we don't want because in in the bargain of using a drug uh, for convenience, what if our ESBL gets converted to carbapenem resistant pathogen? So that's not a good thing to happen. And um, uh, in pediatric UTI, there are very few studies and they, the studies which are there have shown that there are high relapse rates and there's no data for complicated UTI. So when can you use faropenem? If you have a patient who has a diagnosed ESBL UTI, you should never use it empirically. But once your culture reports come back and you find that the patient is ESBL and you have no other oral options available, then you can consider switching to faropenem. But you have to understand that you have to watch for relapse or recurrence. So faropenem, no role for empiric therapy. Even for a definitive therapy, uh, only if you have no other oral option available and your patient is stable and you have to accept that you may have failure and you have to be ready for it. Now, in the end, I would just like to present a couple of um, you know cases. Um, so... Um, uh, you know, this is one case which we recently saw. She was a five-year-old girl who was well, but then she had high fever for four to five days with flank pain, which is the typical presentation of a UTI. She had a high WBC, high CRP and pyuria on urine examination. So she was started on the IV ceftriaxone after sending a urine culture um, and referred to our hospital. And when her urine cultures came, it was an ESBL pathogen because you see that it is ceftriaxone resistant. Um, it is also resistant to cotrimoxazole, but it is sensitive to BLBLIs. It is sensitive to amoxclav, but you may not be able to use it. And carbapenems. And the, uh, the this was quite a virulent pathogen because when she came, her ultrasound kidney showed that she had already developed a right renal abscess. 
So um, we we started this patient on cefepirazone sulbactam, but she continued to have fever. So we um, did a CT guided aspiration of the pus, and after that, the patient's fever got better. So the pus also grew the same E. coli. That means even after giving her cefepirazone sulbactam for four or five days, her pus the uh, the the pus couldn't be sterilized. So we discharged her on IV cefepirazone sulbactam to continue at home. But one day after discharge, she came back with recurrence of fever with high CRP. And the treatment was switched to meropenem. And the CT showed a right, large right re large renal abscess. Now, so basically, the question was that why has the patient again got fever? I think the problem was because we didn't do good source control. So we did a one-time aspiration of the abscess, but obviously the pus filled in. So obviously we had to remove this pus. So we put a pigtail in that pus. And at the same time, we also thought that when your source has a high burden of a, when your ESBL pathogen burden is very high and you, um, you your BLBLIs may not work. So you have to give carbapenems. So with that, actually she gave, became better. We did an MCU which showed no reflux. And we gave her IV meropenem for three weeks and she got better. So this is a case which tells you three or four things. One is that you have a problem of ESBL UTI in the community um, and in a patient with no previous risk factors, no previous antibiotic use. Then second, that uh, when you, you sometimes have complications of the UTI like a renal abscess. And when you have an ESBL UTI with renal abscess, I think good source control is important. And also maybe choosing the right drug is important in this situation. Now, it's possible that we did both the things simultaneously. So if we put a pigtail drain, maybe the cefepirazone sulbactam could have worked, but we didn't want to take that chance. So no, that is how we had ended up using meropenem for this patient. Now, let us come to the second and the last case. This is a 48-day-old male who was exclusively breastfed and he had a blocked nose for three days and he came with fever of one day duration. Now, he had a significant past history that he had, he was late preterm uh, and he had a birth weight of 2.6 kg and he was kept in the NICU for 24 hours for monitoring. But his ultrasound head and KUB were normal, uh, which was done. And uh, he was transferred to mother on day two and the baby was doing well on exclusive breastfeeding. And at six weeks, the weight had gone up to 3.3 kg. But now when this child comes with history of fever for one day, he was quite alert, but he had high fever. And because he was a newborn, I mean, less than 60 days, we investigated him and we found that he had a possible UTI because his urine routine had shown pus cells and uh, bacteria were seen. So we sent a urine and blood culture and we started the child on IV ceftriaxone because I mean, of course, I know that he's a newborn, but we thought that maybe right now ceftriaxone will be enough because it had been quite some time since he was admitted to the NICU. But the child actually worsened. 12 hours after admission, the baby was not feeding, had cold extremities, he was in septic shock. So we had to shift him to the ICU and give, give oxygen fluids and inotropes. And at this point in time, we started change the antibiotic to meropenem because we thought that maybe ceftriaxone is not working. And you can see that his counts also worsened, his lactate went up. And of course, he had, we did an ultrasound just to make sure there was no obstruction somewhere. And he just had thickened urinary bladder wall and mild fullness of the left renal pelvis. Now, 24 hours after admission, the blood and urine cultures are positive for gram-negative bacilli. And the baby is still sick in septic shock. So now it has been almost uh, 12 hours since we've changed to meropenem, but the baby is not improving. Now, in this situation, you know, what are you going to do? So one, one option was that we can just continue meropenem and wait because this child, it takes at least 24 to 48 hours for the antibiotic to start working. The other option was whether we should add amikacin to the regime because we know that the resistance to meropenem is more than the resistance to amikacin or think that this could be carbapenem resistant pathogen and add cholestine. But I mean, why would you think of a carbapenem resistant pathogen in a healthy neonate? This was not like a corti or something in the ICU 
or we can also do a molecular panel for quick identification of pathogen and resistance. So, you know, you have this BCID2 panel. So if your blood culture flags positive, you can do it directly from the blood culture bottle and you can identify all these bacteria and fungi and you can also detect these resistance genes here. So this is something which you can do sometimes in a sick patient if you want to quickly know the pathogen and the resistant pattern. But we didn't go for this panel. We just added cholestine to meropenem because the baby was really sick. And 36 hours later, the blood and urine cultures grew carbapenem resistant E. coli. So if you look at this, it is ceftriaxone resistant. It is also carbapenem resistant. And you, the only drugs to which is sensitive is amikacin. Then, uh, gentamicin, um, uh, tigicycline, obviously, for which you cannot use because tigicycline doesn't go into the urine or blood. Phosphomycin was sensitive. Now, so this is sometimes a situation which you will see when you have a carbapenem resistant pathogen in your urine or blood. How do you treat those patients? So for treatment of such pa uh, patients, <clears throat> cholestine is the backbone. Because um, uh, that is a drug which works against all the gram-negative pathogens. <clears throat> but And remember, for when you use cholestine, you have to use a loading dose of 150,000 units per kg per day of dose and then 50,000 units per kg TDS. And of course, if the creat is high, you have to dose modify. Polymyxin B does not get excreted in the urine, so you can't use it. What are the other drugs you can use? Amikacin or phosphomycin if they are sensitive. Tigacycline cannot be used even if it is sensitive. And if you have carbapenem resistant Klebsiella or E. coli, then you can also use this new, because the problem with using cholestine is that many of your patients already have elevated creatinine and will get worsened. And cholestine, you know, is not a very great drug in itself. You can't use it alone. You have to add something else to it. So you can also, we are looking for other options. And now we know that Ceftazidim avibactam is a drug which works against carbapenem resistant pathogens provided they produce OXA48. But we know many of most of our pathogens produce NDM and OXA both. So we can even use Ceftazidim avibactam with astronam because astronam will work against the NDM and cas -AV will work against the OXA48. But remember, you cannot use it empirically. You have to do a synergy test before starting treatment. That means, and if you look at our isolate, it was septazidine avibactam resistant. So we have to, if we want to use septazidine avibactam plus astronam, we have to do a synergy test. So we changed to cholestine and phosphomycin. Now, um, you could have even given amikacin and phosphomycin. You couldn't give amikacin alone in this patient because it is a serious sepsis in a newborn. Amikacin may be okay if you just have a urinary tract infection. So uh, you you could you would have to have a second drug with it. We did a synergy test um, uh, which came back negative, and the baby improved with this combination because we we were giving cholestine and meropenem. But once you got this susceptibility report. You can't use meropenem because it was resistant and its MIC was more than 16. So we added another drug to cholestine because you can't use cholestine alone. And we added phosphomycin. And then there was a concern about whether this child has meningitis because the child was quite drowsy. And the CSF showed a few cells. The MRI showed meningeal enhancement. So we gave the patient cholestine and phosphomycin for three weeks. And MCU was done later, which showed no reflux. So currently the baby is well. So finally, with that, I would like to end by saying that pediatric UTI is a common clinical problem and you need to have a high index of suspicion. Of course, send the samples properly, start appropriate empiric antibiotics. Once your cultures come, interpret the reports carefully, modify therapy if needed, complete the full course. And of course, this is something which I have not discussed, which is more in your domain, do other investigations if required, treat constipation, which is one of the commonest risk factors for urinary tract infections in children and use prophylaxis in the right setting. So if there was a bundle for proper management of UTI, then all these components would come into the bundle and not just the antimicrobial therapy. I think with that, I would like to end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Singhal. As usual, it was uh, very crisp interesting and uh, we all learned uh, quite a bit we have dr suman poddar uh, our 
chief microbiologist with us and uh, he will lead the discussion but uh, just one question um, i know it is an idiotic one uh, why can't we can't use the cholestin alone can't. i mean if you sometimes you know you can't you don't have an option so many times you'll see a pseudomonas uti where the only drug to which it is susceptible is cholestin then you have to use it alone but generally speaking for serious infections cholestin monotherapy is not recommended so you should always see if there is a second drug which you can add to this patient okay dr suman it is all yours now so uh, actually uh, there was some connectivity issue so i joined uh, i could join ultimately little late after a few slides mm -hmm. of ma'am ma'am uh, a few basic thing uh, UTI, as we all know, that there will be pustules and there will be culture in the uh, in the urinary growth. Sometimes we see, in spite of uh, all the measures, sometimes we see that pustules are low, but culture is there. Should we give importance to it? Actually, no, because most of the times, I mean, that is um, that could be you have to be very careful that you are not having some other cause of fever, because uh, generally. Uh, inflammation should be there and you can have a positive urine culture for many reasons. You have not collected the sample properly or the sample has been lying outside and you get a positive culture. So that is why I think very rarely um, you may also do some other investigation in such a situation like you can do an ultrasound KUB to look for subtle changes. If you have such a patient and you find that the kidneys are ecogenic or the bladder has debris, then you may think that yes, there could be a UTI. And one more yes. important thing is that you have to send the urine for routine also promptly because if you send, if your urine routine keeps lying, your cells may get autolyzed. So you may not pick up the pus cells. So, so when you have a situation like this, don't jump and treat the urine culture. Look for, you know, other things as well. Yes, that's what I was uh, trying to ask uh, because many a times it happens. Uh, another thing, uh, the present like a wonder drug with a huge of company pressure and all this so ethical unethical that is something different now empirical faropenem in uti would you recommend but absolutely not we would not recommend empirical faropenem because it's not a great drug and still you know you see a lot of susceptible utis and you see esbl utis where your suffix also works because it gets concentrated in the urine so I would say, please do not use ferropenem empirically. It may, uh, you use it only if you have a ESBL UTI where you have your cotrimoxazole, which is resistant and uh, you can use it because there is no data. I mean, you where is the sensitivity data for ferropenem? There is no lab which will tell you whether ferropenem is sensitive or not. Then how can you rely on using an antibiotic like this? In fact, there is no uh, breakpoint uh, for faropenem. I don't know why and how the different uh, authorities are saying that faropenem is a wonder drug. I don't find any merit on it. Uh, so, so uh, I had one question. Like, like suppose uh, you have a ESBL UTI and the uh, family doesn't want to get admit for meropenem and it is not it is not sensitive to to a cotrimoxazol. Can that be one of the the reason for giving ferropenem for 48 hours into two hours and then see yeah you can especially if your patient is not sick you know if like because if yeah, it's a definitely. sick patient now then you must understand that every day you don't treat the uti properly definitely, your nephrons yeah. get lost isn't it they die so that is why prompt appropriate treatment for the uti is important especially if it is a sick patient but if your patient I think, you know, what mostly happens is that you send a urine culture and you start cefexime in a patient. After 48 hours, your report comes that it is ESBL. And then you have to decide how to treat. Now, if your patient has already responded to cefexime, then why would you want to switch to ferropenem, isn't it? You can continue cefexime only. There's no point. The point comes that if after 48 hours your patient is not responding to cefexime, then what are you going to do? Will you admit and give BLBLI combination IV or will you try oral ferropenem? I think it all depends on the clinical condition of the patient. If the patient is running 103, 104 fever after 48 hours, then this is a patient where you might even then want to give intramuscular aminoglycoside. But you know, um, you wouldn't dabble with ferro ferropenem here. 
So on the other hand, the patient is having some hundred fever, <laughs> otherwise active, eating, drinking. Okay, then that is a patient where you could consider using ferropenem. I think that is also relevant for the resource poor setting. Uh, a, a child in maybe in the periphery, uh, far away from the hospital, and not able to reach the hospital. If you want to earn some time for that uh, time frame, you yeah, may I add ferropenem for the time being. and i think we need to collect data i'm not saying it's not a good drug it could turn out to be a good drug so i think it is important that maybe we start documenting our experience with use of ferropenem you know people who are using it like nephrologists they can at least have a cohort of 30 50 children and they can see what were the outcomes in these patients with esbl uti and if you publish that and you find that 80% of your children did well and didn't need switch to another alternative <laughs> antibiotic that would be good data so i think we have to use it cautiously and if when we are whenever we are using it we need to record our uh, experience with ferropenem yeah uh, that can be easily be done we, i have been trying to uh, inspire dr poddar but uh... No, Hopefully no. I, I, I am. All, I am also uh, behind it because, but getting the disc or the E strip is not possible. The disc is not there. So I am after the companies if they can provide some. But till date, uh, they have not yet uh, turned up. They are just interested in selling their product. <laughs> And one more thing, ma'am, you said that uh, coamoxiclav, coamoxiclav in UTI, as that gets concentrated in the urine. so that can be an option even in certain cases of espl producers also now how to decide when i can try with amoxiclav when i cannot in a in an espl setting no so see i am talking about empiric therapy so if you are if you are seeing a lot of esbl uti then you might want to use amoxiclav instead of cefexime as the empiric drug because that is one area where amoxiclav scores over cefexime that where cefexime will not work really for may not work for esbl pathogens your amoxiclav will work but i mean i wouldn't say that um, and uh, but after like suppose you have given cefexime and the patient is not better in 48 hours and your fever is persisting and you know it's an esbl then i would rather go to ferropenem than go to amoxiclav i mean that's what i would like to say but uh, so that is this kind of discussion is going around that if we are seeing so much esbl and we know that amoxiclav gets concentrated in the urine highly uh, then uh, would there be a role of use changing our empiric therapy to amoxiclav instead of cefexime yes so ma'am another thing uh... colistin nowadays mostly comes in the category of intermediate sensitive now uh, since there is a disclaimer from the biomedu that uh, you cannot rely confidently on the sensitivity report of colistin uh, from, from the vitek now how to uh, consider colistin as an uh, in this in that scenario see we must understand that one is that your lab has to do a broth micro dilution for colistin because there is just a 10% chance of error that your vitek will pronounce a resistant isolate as sensitive so if your vitek says that it is resistant then that's fine that means it is resistant but sometimes if it is sensitive it will show it may be resistant and this reason why it is called as intermediate sensitive is not so much because susceptibility testing is not reliable it is because the penetration of the drug at the various sites is poor and the in vivo efficacy is poor that is why they are saying it it as intermediately sensitive okay so it is not just because of the reliability of testing is not there it's just telling clinicians that if you have an alternative drug use that or if you are using colistin add something to it but in the practical situation that is the only antibiotic we can rely on in patients with carbapenem resistant uti because we don't have anything else to offer unless we are dealing with klebsiella where we can use casav with or without astronam but e coli 30 to 40% of your e coli is resistant to casav astronam and if it is pseudomonas you have no other option so then you have to use colistin right ma'am and what about that uh, intravenous phosphomycin in case of klebsiella yes, yes. so <clears throat> unfortunately klebsiella 
resistance rates to phosphomycin are high, but E. coli sensitivity to phosphomycin is very good. And there is some data actually showing that you can even use phosphomycin as monotherapy for E. coli UTI. Because normally it is said that phosphomycin you should not use as monotherapy because resistance develops quickly. But there is emerging data that phosphomycin um, with or without amikacin may be a good option for carbapenem resistant E. coli UTI. But for Klebsiella, for most of the strains are resistant to phosphomycin. So there you have an option of Casavi with Astronom. So you have other options too. For carbapenem resistant E. coli, you have phosphomycin. For carbapenem resistant Klebsiella, you have Casavi and Astronom. And for carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas, unfortunately, you have to use cholestine or sometimes it can be sensitive to phosphomycin. You can try phosphomycin at that time. Okay, ma'am. And then uh, lastly comes another thing. Rarely we come into an occasion when it is pan drug resistant. And uh, even uh, cholesterol is intermediate and pan drug resistant. Even CAS AV is resistant, Klebsiella. Now, especially in the NICU setting. So also, remember that as so far, 100% of our Klebsiella are sensitive to CAS AV plus Astrona. Okay, so you can use that. <coughs> But uh, uh, if that happens, then no, no, so there was, I don't know whether it was uh, whether it was uh, there was some error or not. But very recently we have got one in the from the NICU. No, no, CASAVI resistance is very common. Hundred percent is CASAVI resistant. But if you do a synergy test with CASAVI and Astronam for Klebsiella, it okay. will work. Uh, e. coli may not work, but for Klebsiella, it is working all the time. The synergy is there. So that is why for Klebsiella now, the drug of choice is Casavi with Astrona. Not what about Acinetobacter? What about Acinetobacter? Acinetobacter? So I didn't talk about Acinetobacter because it's not a common cause of UTI. But that is the biggest problem because in Acinetobacter, normally the only drug which you use, you can use is cholestine. And um, uh, sometimes you may want to add Sulbactam, Minocycline may work sometimes. So those are the other drugs. But if you look at all the top four gram negative pathogens, the ones which is really becoming very difficult to treat is Acinetobacter. Because for yes, other drugs, there's some options. Especially uh, in, in ICU setting, in the setting of sepsis. Uh, there is one question from Dr. Suman Rao. Uh, what to do if child with complicated UTI is partially treated? And is partially well on ceftriaxone on day three to upgrade or to add on or to continue the same. So if it is only partially well on day three, you have to change. There's no point adding anything to ceftriaxone. If the child is completely well at 48 to 72 hours, then you can continue the same. But if the child is still running fever and you have a ESBL UTI, you will have to go to either cefagarazone, sulbactam, or you'll have to go to aminoglycoside. And there's no point of adding the aminoglycoside to ceftriaxone. You can just give aminoglycoside monotherapy also. Sometimes we rely too much on the CRP report. In the inpatient, we rely too much on the CRP report. Uh, if there is cystitis, is it that always the CRP will be high? No. And cystitis okay. is not a problem to treat. Because cystitis, you know, even if you are having an ESBL cystitis, you find that you use amoxiclav, it works well because it goes into the urine in such high levels. The problem is mostly your pyelonephritis. That is the thing. Yeah. And another thing you must remember that the CRP starts declining after 72 hours or 48 to 72 hours of starting therapy. So at 48 hours, if your fever is better, but your CRP is not down, you could wait another day. No, I am I am saying other way around. The child is actually having urinary pustules plenty, and there is a culture of uh, E. coli, probably ESBL producing, and the CRP is not that high after two days of uh, some urinary discomfort, maybe dysuria or something. Uh, so in that scenario, uh, sometimes we are in a dilemma to uh, go with CRP or not to go with the CRP. I think no, you should not, not should go not, with the CRP. Should you should treat it as cystitis and nitrofurantoin may be an excellent drug here because most of our ESBL pathogens are sensitive to nitrofurantoin and you can use that. So that is something. So I think you your decision about whether you are treating dealing with an upper UTI or a lower UTI should be on the basis of fever. If fever is present, it means it's an upper UTI. If fever is absent, it could be a lower UTI. There's another question, ma'am. Uh, 
for fungal UTI, M4 versus lipo M4, which is better regarding renal issue, renal tissue concentration. So first of all, now you have to be sure that you're dealing with a fungal UTI or a candida UTI because many times your patient who has been chronically catheterized and who's on antibiotics will grow candida in the urine. So you cannot be certain whether that candida is actually a pathogen or is it a colonizer. Okay, so that is the first thing. But let us say you have made that decision that this candida needs to be treated. Then fluconazole is the best drug because it penetrates very well in the urine. Um, and sometimes you can even treat resistant pathogens with fluconazole because of the very high level that it achieves, such as candida cruzi, candida glabrata, you can get away. Now, if the isolate is fluconazole resistant, then it's conventional amphobe because your liposomal amphobe will not go into the kidney. So you can't use it. Even drugs like voriconazole don't penetrate the urine. Even your echinocandins are not excreted in the urine. So your choices are between fluconazole and conventional amphotericin B. And okay. flu cytosine. So flu cytosine is also an excellent drug for candida. Most candida are susceptible. It gets excreted well into the urine, but you cannot use it alone. You'll have to use some other drug along with it. But so, um, so again, as I said, for candida UTI, you have to be certain that it is really a infection issue there. It's not just a colonizer. Uh, there is a question made by uh, Shangjukta. She said that isn't it better if we get the antibiotic sensitivity report, but the breakpoint MIC is also mentioned. Yeah, as so the problem antibiotic. is that most of the HIS systems or the lab information systems, okay. they don't have the provision of writing the MI. The, but if, like our lab attaches it. Um, yeah, so you have to call the lab and ask them what is the breakpoint. And uh, or you use this breakpoint MIC app. So that can tell you the breakpoint. That is the issue. Um, in fact, there are many labs who don't even write the MIC. So the first step is that they should write the MIC. And then there is the issue of the breakpoint. And, and actually, if you um, are doing it every time, now you just have to remember a few breakpoints. So for example, me, the common breakpoints now you remember, you know, you have to remember Piptazo, you have to remember Meropenem for E. coli and Klebsiella, or you have to remember some of these common breakpoints. If you keep using them, you always you tend to remember them. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, as so far, my understanding, faropenem needs further uh, things or further uh, support from different research. Uh, so, blindly, we can't rely on it with some few exceptions. But nowadays, we are seeing more and more uh, growing of ESBL E. coli. Uh, if it is 80% in Chennai, it is nothing less in Kolkata. So uh, with this, I think uh, there is one more. No. OK. So uh, Rajiv, sir, would you like to comment? Uh, no. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Singhal uh, and uh, Dr. Poddha. I mean, uh, all this discussion made us uh, realize like uh, why we need a uh, IT specialist and I would request uh, and we are having it already in the ICH but I, I would really request more active rounds from the from the IT specialist in in ICH Be, because like uh, certain aspects like uh, you know um, whether to go only with cholestine or or add something else uh, when to uh, combine this avibac, when to choose avibac term and uh, and combine it with asternum, all this uh, sometimes, and uh, and I've already owned up uh, as a uh, when we started. All these new drugs uh, are also so difficult to to pronounce. Also, <laughs> uh, no, actually, sir, uh, nowadays it's it's going to be uh, tailor made therapy. And the future is that you need you know your resistance gene. The resistant bug is with you. You know the yeah. resistance. You should uh, yeah. accordingly. You tailor it out. See, mentioned that also. So uh, you should be be bringing it to the ICH. No, we we have it. We have it. We have it for the uh, for the blood now. Uh, as of now, if we if you want it for the organism per se, that is also possible. Sure. It's possible now. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, then uh, Dr. Rasingal, thank you again thank you. for, for thank joining you. us. And uh, hopefully we will have you uh, in our nephrology community soon, face to face.